All right, welcome into Surviving Paradise, the podcast that takes a sometimes serious, oftentimes humorous look at the claim by Jehovah's Witnesses that they're living in a modern-day spiritual paradise. Welcome in. I am your host, Stacy Bauman, former elder, ministerial servant, and most importantly, a kid raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the 70s and 80s. Warning, as I always do here, some of the subject matter can trigger people. It's a long journey out of Jehovah's Witnesses and oftentimes a very difficult and emotional one. We try to have some fun here, sarcasm, humor, all of it is all mind. And please note from the heart that it's never meant to offend anyone. We just try to have a good time, heal, and every now and then we have a good cry because it's necessary. So again, welcome in. I have to discuss one of my all-time favorite subjects in my time as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I must say, one of my all-time favorites, particularly as an elder. I wanted to tackle this one for a long time. And I want to thank each one of you that takes the time to listen to this crazy little show for enduring my crazy stream of consciousness regarding so many subjects. I have a feeling I'm going to go off the wall a little bit with this one. And I'm hopeful... I can do this particular subject justice in the time allotted. I'm going to give it my best shot. As is always the case, there's much more that can be said, researched, and shared on this little show. But what we really try to do is just take that top layer, the emotions. And this is one of those subjects that I feel like has impacted particularly the brains of far too many people on this planet among Jehovah's Witnesses. But let me ask you, who loves a good horror movie? Now, as most will know, I grew up in the 1980s. And let me tell you what, that decade pumped out some classics. Poltergeist, Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween. In the 70s, when I was a, a littler guy, I had to endure well-placed trailers for movies like The Exorcist, The Shining, Rosemary's Baby, uh, see a past episode on Jehovah's Witnesses and entertainment or on the demons if you want to get some of my thoughts on some of those things. But full disclosure, I was terrified of this stuff as a kid. I've shared before, I thought the demons could come through the television or the movie screen and actually enter the room or attack me. And I didn't get that idea just because I was a silly little kid. I got that idea mostly from Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I'd close my eyes, repeat Jehovah's name over and over and over again in my head until the trailer ended on the television set. And I sure as hell never watched these movies. I want to say right out of the shoot, I'd never seen these movies. I don't think I've ever seen Poltergeist, Nightmare, Halloween, ah, Exorcist, nah. I have seen The Shining, but I've never seen these movies. Jason, Freddy Krueger, ghosts, demons, possessed girls whose heads spin around. This kid, and even again as an adult, eh, I thought this stuff was really scary. I thought this stuff was really bad and terrifying in so many ways. As I mentioned, I've talked about this before. But listen... Throw it all out. Throw all those movies and all that terror out of the room. Those movies were mere child's play for my life as a Jehovah's Witness. As a child in Jehovah's Witnesses, there was something that may have trumped any and all horror movies. And granted, it may have been the result of an overactive imagination of a little boy. But the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses and the presidents that came before them are infatuated with a lot of things. It just depends on the guy. If you're Tony Morris, you're infatuated with tight pants and homosexuality. If you're Stephen Lett, well, let's just say he doesn't like kids. <laughs> if you're Sam Hurd, he has an awful lot to say about women, doesn't he? But when it comes to the Bible, one of their biggest infatuations, and I might add, Possibly the biggest infatuation of the governing body is the book of Revelation. It's that book of Revelation and the five books they've written to explain that book of Revelation 
that created a steady rotation of nightmares for a child among Jehovah's Witnesses. Almost all Christian faiths in modern times have taken a stab at Revelation and also the book of Daniel because, after all, somehow they tie together. Eh, we'll get a little bit into that. Numbers, monsters, horns, blood and guts, lion heads, locusts with human heads. There's a whole bunch to say on whores. There's babies in danger. And through it all, the governing body tries to tie that in with Daniel to arrive at certain things that fit their narrative. But let's back up a minute. Let this sink in for a moment. They have written five, that's right, five books on Revelation to teach the rest of us what the book of Revelation written by God is actually about. Five. Five books to, you know, give us a better look at the book written by God. But as you ponder that little fact, consider this. Also from the Bible, at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we get this. Quote, all scripture is inspired of God, including revelation, and beneficial for teaching, for reproving, for setting things straight, for disciplining in righteousness, so that the man of God may be fully competent, completely equipped for every good work. End quote. Apparently, though, that doesn't apply to Revelation. Ah, yes, a scripture from the Bible that I could probably quote every episode. But again, regarding the book of Revelation, they've written five books because apparently the verse I just read just doesn't apply, not to Revelation. When the Bible, inspired by Jehovah, gifted to us by his son, says fully competent, completely equipped, he really just meant, well, uh, sort of, kind of. Jehovah needs some guys in New York to write five books to explain the book of Revelation. So, well, starting with that fact, the questions begin. One has to wonder why it took five books. I guess the one wasn't enough again, and oh, we can now start taking a look at what those illustrious five books given to us by Jehovah and his son have to say about the book of Revelation. And just in case you would like to see these books or you would like to own your own copy, I have some bad news. And albeit strange news. All five of these books inspired by and written under the direction of Jehovah and Jesus themselves, and undoubtedly infused with Holy Spirit, or so we're told by the governing body, all five of those books are, well, get this, they're out of print, <laughs> and they're no longer available even in your Kingdom Hall library if you went looking for one. Now, why would that be? <laughs> I need answers on Revelation. Now, to get those answers, you can find some of this online or find one on eBay. If you want to find one of these books infused with Holy Spirit, they're no longer offered by Jehovah's Witnesses. It's all part of preaching this good news of the kingdom in the last days. Jesus is now apparently utilizing eBay and Amazon to share messages regarding the book of Revelation. <laughs> Feel free to Google that you will find them almost instantly. And might I add, they're quite expensive. <laughs> so again, these messages that are life or death, and there were five of them, are no longer available to someone who wants to serve Jehovah. He decided to pull them out of print, but you can find them on eBay or Amazon. For the person of faith looking to educate themselves on all things Revelation, Allow me to share with you the five choices that Jehovah sent down to the guys in New York in the beginning. Uh, there was some Pennsylvania, there was some Brooklyn, New York, there's now upstate New York. 
Here's the five books that we are told mean life or death to us. There is 1917's The Finished Mystery. There is 1930's Light 1 and 2 by the infamous Judge Joe Rutherford. There's 1963's Babylon the Great Has Fallen. There is 1969's Then Is Finished the Mystery of God. And then finally in 1988, we received Revelation, the grand climax at hand. Again, all are out of print and unavailable through Jehovah's Witnesses, God's people, but hard copies of this life and death information to all of mankind is available in spiritual centers such as Amazon or eBay. Oh, and the governing body mothballed them all, but interestingly, they haven't had any new books on Revelation or any new light in 39 years. Make that 35 years, excuse me. 35 years of hanging on to their last comments on the book of Revelation. I thought it would be fun, and again, maybe only to me, to take a look at each of these books. Some of the entertaining, uh, I mean, critical highlights from each current belief of Jehovah's Witnesses. Remember, everything I cover here is in print and can be found on their website. And I state that for anyone who's interested in fact-checking or if you are a Jehovah's Witness who's listening in and bravely entered into the Dave, the, the den, I should say, of a mentally diseased apostate, they're all in print and was shared with Jehovah's Witnesses as inspired information from Jehovah and Jesus himself. And listen, warning, like the movies of the 70s and 80s that scared the living hell out of me, the following information scared me even worse. Things like lions with wings. The little guy in me was thinking, wait, lions can fly? <laughs> Things like a leopard with four heads dragons, a seven-headed beast, horns, fangs, lots of blood, locusts that fly through the air, but they're sporting human heads, and scorpion tails, fire, lots of whores. There's a lot to say here on whores and prostitutes, but the whore gets eaten. Plagues, violence, death itself rides a horse, Birds show up, they eat the guts of billions of dead bodies, and kids who just showed up to the Kingdom Hall in a clip-on tie in the 70s is there to take it all in, this kid included. As I mentioned, scared the hell out of me as a kid. But aside from the symbolic and oftentimes horrifying imagery in Revelation and duplicated in full color by Jehovah's Witnesses, the verses in the Bible might not be the worst of it. As you get older, you realize it's their explanations of all of this stuff found in the book of Revelation that is truly horrifying, and I might add, utterly comical. It's downright hilarious. Would you like a sampling? And remember, this book is held as mysterious, cosmic, a head trip, stuff that scholars and everyone has tried to dig into and figure out what it's all about. We get it from John. He's an old guy on an island in exile. But let's start here. And it's very important. Where did the book of Revelation come from according to Jehovah's Witnesses? From their literature, Insight from the Scriptures, Volume 2, pages 17, excuse me, 798 through 801, under the subheading Revelation to John, we are told this, quote, Jehovah God the Almighty is the book's author, and the channel of information is Jesus Christ, who sent it to John and presented it to him by means of his angel. There you have it. Oh, end quote. Excuse me. There you have it. The book features Jesus giving the information to a select angel who then apparently gives it to John. No word yet on why Jesus, who we're told, knew the, the Apostle John. That's 
actually some controversy. It might be a different John, according to scholars, but Jehovah's Witnesses believe it's the Apostle John. No word yet on why Jesus didn't speak to the Apostle that he mm, particularly loved, or so John tells us in his Gospel. Another odd detail that many just overlook. Nonetheless, let's take a look at the five books and the dissemination of information that goes out to millions of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think it's important to note here that while the new light people like to throw around new light and misapply something that has nothing to do with ever-changing information, see a past episode, I want to encourage people that as you listen to this, remember, these are living, breathing, breathing human beings that are receiving this information. And they're supposed to change their lives based on this information, depending on the time period they got this from Jehovah, then Jesus, then his angel, then the governing body. This is supposed to make you change your life. And if it's wrong, well, uh, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Let's start in the early part of the last century, 1917's The Finished Mystery. Could we do a two-hour episode? <laughs> we simply don't have the time. But let me tell you something. This nugget of Holy Spirit that we're told comes from Jehovah, Jehovah God himself. This book is too much fun. And I try to place myself in 1917, getting this book, popping open the pages and going, Wow, you don't say to the information I'm about to share. And keep in mind that Bible students and everyone that received this book were told to preach it to other people as coming from Jehovah himself. Don't underestimate that fact. It's unbelievable. How about a few highlights, or as I like to say, nuggets of Holy Spirit from Jesus Guys in New York from 1917's The Finnish Mystery their first stab at explaining the book of Revelation. As I read this, it's very important to note that this book was, for the most part, most of it, aside from volume seven, was written by Chuck Taze Russell. He tells us in the Watchtower that he is the mouthpiece of God. And he wrote the first six books in the study in the scriptures. The Finnish mystery was the seventh we're going to get into some strange details on the seventh book. Nonetheless, some highlights. From Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom, you remember the big green book, chapter 6, pages 61 through 71, there is a section called Time of Testing, 1914 to 1918, the period when we got the finished mystery. It tells us this, quote, Brother Russell had been unable to produce this volume during his lifetime though he had hoped to do so. Following his death, the executive committee of the society arranged for... No governing body? The executive committee of the society arranged for two associates, Clayton J. Woodworth and George H. Fisher, to prepare this book, which was a commentary on Revelation, the Song of Solomon and Ezekiel. There's a joke in there, folks. What do you get when you get Revelation? The Song of Solomon and Ezekiel walk into a bar? That is the strange... Anyway, back to the quote. In part, it was based on what Russell had written about these Bible books, and other comments and explanations were added. The completed manuscript was approved for publication by officers of the society and was released to the Bethel family at the dining table on Tuesday, July 17th, 1917, end quote. I hope I read that slow enough. There's a lot in that paragraph that, well, do you have some questions? <laughs> How about this one? Did they just admit that the mouthpiece of God, Charles Taze Russell, was now dead? He didn't actually write the Finnish mystery in 1917. He just left some notes behind and that they just quickly found two guys that were not the mouthpiece of God to uh, roll out a book on Revelation. <laughs> 
you'll note there was no governing body, just something called an executive committee. And they just found two guys that were not the mouthpiece of God, just two guys, to finish up by looking at some notes and chicken scratch that Chuck left behind before he died. A little bit of an overlooked detail, wouldn't you say? Did Jesus shift gears, decided he want, wanted Chuck in heaven, and he just had two other guys that weren't their mouthpiece of God to write his first book on Revelation? God's mouthpiece is gone. There's a committee of the society. We have no idea who's on the executive committee they mentioned, by the way. Stepped in for who? Uh, God? To assign two new guys to talk to the rest of us? Ah, yes. And so the inspiration among Jehovah's Witnesses at the turn of the last century begins. And when you hear what is in this book, that these two guys were uh, asked to finish for Chuck, he was in heaven now, I think you'll agree it's truly inspired. It's very inspiring. Are you ready for some highlights? Again, gotta reiterate, we got Jesus in heaven. It's 1917, he's king now. He's elected some executive committee guys and two guys that they picked to now be his mouthpiece. They oddly are never his mouthpiece after this book again. Let's be brief. Let's go to some highlights. Page four. Charles Tace Russell is the faithful and wise slave. Wait a minute. Isn't that all the anointed? Oh, oops, now just the governing body. Things change. Page 66. Jesus began his reign as king officially in 1878. Uh, oops, uh, Jesus gave this information to these two guys that were elected by some committee of whom we don't know who was on it. And did somebody get a typo? Did Chuck leave some chicken scratch that was mistaken? 1878, Jesus became king? Jesus fixed that later under the judge to 1914. Things change a lot. Page 171, oddly, the time of the end, yes, the last days covered in a past episode, started in 1799, even though Jesus wasn't king, apparently, for another 79 years. It gets confusing here when you're trying to wrap your arms around Holy Spirit from heaven. Page 64, the remaining anointed would go to heaven in the spring of 1918. It, is this a good time to ask God's mouthpiece about overlapping generations? Never mind, I digress. Page 128. Demons will invade the minds of churchgoers in 1918, leading to their destruction. No word on how they do this or who tells them to do this. Chuck just said they're going to do it. Sorry, scratch that. Not Chuck, not God's mouthpiece. Two guys that were just elected to collect his notes. Page 485, Other Religions, a theme in Revelation, I might add, also in the year 1918, when God destroys the churches wholesale and the church members by millions. That's a quote. In 1918, religion and everyone who was anyone but a Jehovah's Witness or Bible student at that time was going to be killed. Page 258, Not to be left out, you can't get away from the governments and politics, something the judge really got into later. Quote, even the republics will disappear in the fall of 1920. Every kingdom of earth will pass away, be swallowed up in anarchy. Ah, yes, the dates are moving. It's like the cup game. We got 1799, we got 1878, we've got 1918, 1920, governments are gone. Huh, I wonder how many Jehovah's Witnesses remember that. Page 276, the voice from heaven of Revelation 18.4 is actually the Watchtower Society. That's right, can be found on page 276. And if you thought those highlights from this book were good, check out a few others. Page 1, excuse me, page 85, the Leviathan of Job 41, 2 through 19 is a locomotive. It's a train. In page 93, the valiant men of Nahum 2-3 are actually an engineer and a fireman. I mean, why not? Page 139, the earth was created 48,000 years ago. Come on, what do we expect, folks? 
This is a guy who busted out rulers, went to Egypt, and was measuring steps on pyramids. Page 273. The glory of the angel of Revelation 18.1 refers to modern discoveries such as correspondence schools, celluloid, divine plan of the ages, one of his publications, talking machines, must be the precursor to cell phones, vacuum cleaners, vacuum cleaners made, they dare be, made their debut in Revelation. The Bible book of Revelation featured vacuum cleaners. That's right. Induction motors, pasteurization, the Panama Canal slips in there, shoe sewing machines. That's right. These were the guys that led to the evil of Nike in 2023. Subways, skyscrapers, early x-ray technology, and the list goes on. Did you know that that was all given to John on the island of Patmos and is in the book of Revelation? Vacuum cleaners. Imagine John's despondency to be sitting in exile knowing that one day he'd be able to vacuum stuff up off the floor. Unbelievable. But listen, this one's my favorite. From this illustrious book, on page 230, we get Revelation 1420 of the Bible predicted the precise distance from the place where the finished mystery, this very book you're holding in your hand, it predicted the precise distance from the place where this book was produced in Stratton, Pennsylvania, to its shipping destination in Bethel in New York City. That's right. At the time of its writing, Revelation 14 was a prophecy about printing and shipping books and the distance, minus GPS, no cell phones, no UPS or FedEx. Revelation 14 was about the distance where this book was written and where it was shipped or printed and shipped to. <laughs> Inspiration from the notes of God's mouthpiece and two guys that we don't know much about that just read his notes and collected them together. <laughs> but while entertaining, it's the fact that the governing body continues to roll this book from 1917 out as evidence that Jehovah is truly blessing only them. They are now the mouthpiece of God. From the Jehovah's Witnesses Proclaimers of God's Kingdom, page 69, published at the late date of 1993, but pointing back to this book, says, quote, Through the close of 1917 and into 1918, the Bible students energetically distributed the new book, The Finished Mystery. By the end of 1917, the printers were busy on the 850,000 editions. The Watchtower of December 15, 1917 reported, the sale of the seventh volume is unparalleled by the sale of any other book known in the same length of time except uh, the Bible, end quote. The book they made is a bestseller. We're selling God's inspired stuff to people. And the only thing that trumps it is, well, uh, the original book we're talking about? It's always good to get an updated sales report on life-saving information to all of mankind. This book was only bested by the book you wrote the book about, a book God was the original author of. Pay no attention. Quote, In 1917, the Bible students published The Finnish Mystery, a powerful commentary on Revelation and Ezekiel. This comes to us from Revelation, its grand climax at hand in 1988, page 165. Why do I share that? Because they're still pointing at this book that they say prophesied about vacuum cleaners and trains and firemen as proof that they were blessed by Jehovah. A powerful commentary indeed, folks. So powerful was it that we can no longer get this book for our own library. <laughs> I could go on for an hour on the finished mystery, but I won't. It was book number one in a series of unbelievable books 
that they say Jehovah needed their help with to explain eh, his first book. And again, they continue to point at the finished mystery as a real achievement. It was in their last book on Revelation, as I just read. Let's move on. 1930s Light, 1 and 2 by The Judge. What a character. Somebody please finance and make a movie about this guy. But in 1930s Light, it reads on the inside page of the book, quote, Light, the physical facts set forth showing fulfillment of the revelation which God gave unto Jesus Christ to show unto his servants, end quote. I share that quote in their second book on Revelation produced because the judge calls them facts. Everything in his little book is indeed a fact. We've moved from Jehovah to Jesus to angels to John to an executive committee we don't know who's on it to two guys that we never hear from again and now we're to the judge when it comes to the Bible book of Revelation and what follows are facts. Light One, his little book, saw a total interpretation of the book of Revelation, one that is mostly retained to this day. Many of the features from Judge Joe on Revelation still have life among Jehovah's Witnesses. If you do research, you'll see they've rotated, changed, changed back a few times, but they're still there. The 1920s and 30s, which saw the writing of Light One and Two, were the judge's time to make dramatic doctrinal changes to this little religion. Russell's chronology, Chuck, and many of his other teachings, you know, like vacuum cleaners and stuff, were rejected. They got kicked out. In light one, he moved away from firemen, railroad cars, and other stuff in Revelation to leverage the book to create a second group of people known as the Great Crowd something Jesus himself kept secret even after this book until 1935. And who wouldn't? It's by far the most important doctrinal teaching because it affects billions of people and their salvation. From the Revelation, its grand climax at handbook, their last one, page 119 to 120, uh, the 1988 book written to apparently fix the 1930 book, Light 1 and 2, it says this, quote, And as late as 1930, the thought was expressed in Light Book 1, quote, Those who make up this great crowd fail to respond to the invitation to become the zealous witnesses for the Lord. They were described as a self-righteous group that had a knowledge of the truth but did little about preaching it. They were given to heaven as a secondary class that would not share in reigning with Christ. Wait a minute, for those of us in modern times, did he just say the great crowd was a self-righteous group that didn't want to preach? That's right. In Light 1 and 2, the second book on Revelation by the governing body, the great crowd was originally bad guys, according to Jesus, through Judge Joe. But listen, just five years later, no word yet on why it took five years, the great crowd were people that suddenly are righteous people. They love preaching, and they now get to live forever on a paradise earth with lions, tigers, and bears and eat fruit forevermore. If you're getting dizzy yet, you should be. They went from bad guys in the second book, Light 1 and 2, 1930s, to paradise dwellers in a span of mere months. That Revelation book is apparently really tricky. And there's no word yet on how Jesus uh, was communicating this to the judge uh, or even how this happened and was there confusion. How did we go from bad guys who won't preach to good guys who love preaching, therefore you get to live forever? There's never an explanation. It's the second book in the society stab at the Bible book of Revelation written by Jehovah. But one more highlight in the interest of time from Light One by Judge Joe Rutherford. And as anyone knows, I hate math. There's so many more people online and elsewhere that are so good at breaking down all these numbers and doing that stuff. I just don't have any interest in it. But this one is fascinating. 
Revelation 11, 3 through 6 discusses a period of three and a half years or 1,260 days. During the 1800s, the Watchtower claimed this was prophetic of 1,260 years. There are two prophets, a woman and 1,260 years, uh, allegedly. But zero proof of when this starts, or if they're actually years, or anything else. But that didn't stop the judge in Light 1 and 2. We are told that Light 1 explained those 1,260 days extended from the November 7, 1914 release of a Watchtower article to May 7, 1918 issuing of an arrest order on Judge Joe Rutherford and his friends on the Watchtower board. That's right. Without going too deep into this, no one knows why a Watchtower article in November 7th is critical or how it all leads up to the judge's arrest. But if you let yourself think about it for a couple of minutes, you begin to realize that the book of Revelation found in the Bible is all about him. <laughs> That's right. The book of Revelation given to mankind in the holy book is actually all about Judge Joe Rutherford in many ways. Light 1, pages 198 and 199, says this, quote, The article, that critical article, published in the November 1st issue of The Watchtower, would be in the hands of its readers by the end of the first week. Uh, you see what I'm saying? November 7th. It was the November 1st. Okay, thank you. This Watchtower article is what starts the 1,260 days. It Back to the quote, it will be in the by the end of the week or by the seventh day of November 1914. Uh, you kind of start to realize the judge when writing light was kind of mapping this out. Back to the quote, 42 months of 30 days or 1,260 days, which is equivalent to three and one half years solar time beginning the first week in November to wit November 7th, 1914, would then end on the seventh day of May, 1918. Exactly 42 months after the publication of the aforementioned sackcloth article in the November 7th Watchtower, to wit, on the seventh day of May, 1918, all the officers of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, and who were then the publishers of the Watchtower, were overcome in this, and they were arrested under warrant charging a violation of the espionage law and trading with the enemy, and their work stopped. End quote. Really convoluted apologies, but want to make sure you know that's in print. But now back to me. Thank you, Jehovah and Jesus, for confirming this. But uh, wait, according to this quote from Light, I'm doing some quick math here. Um, this Watchtower article in November 7th, 1914 to May 7th, 1918. Wait a minute. Again, I hate math, but I'm doing some quick math on my calculator. That actually isn't 1,260 days. Um, it's actually 1,277 days between the Watchtower article and Judge Joe getting arrested. Uh, <laughs> but he applied the 1,260 days to a Watchtower article and him going behind bars. But it's off by like 17 days. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. There is one thing I apparently have in common with Judge Joe Rutherford. We both hate math. <laughs> But you're likely sensing a pattern. Revelation in the Bible is a fluid book, according to Jehovah's Witnesses. It's always changing. There's always a new understanding. And it all has to do with them. Jehovah's Witnesses. And particularly the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses. A book that most scholars agree is filled with visions and allegory for what amounts to basically the Roman Empire, the, their take on churches, and some of the stuff the apostles were doing in the first century is all about actually Jehovah's Witnesses and 
Jehovah's Witnesses are now writing books about Revelation to tell you it's all about Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> oh, boy. Can you see why I enjoy this subject? I'm only going to briefly touch on the next two books. Remember, there are five. We've got The Finished Mystery, 1917. we got Light 1 and 2, 1930, and some highlights from both of those. But then, thrust upon mankind in 1963, the book Babylon the Great Has Fallen, God's Kingdom Rules, which discusses, oddly, Revelation chapters 14 through 22. Not the whole book. It took it in sections. After all, Holy Spirit is limited. <laughs> but... I remember even as an adult, as an elder, as I got older and I was much more studious, the title alone in this book is a bit of a problem, isn't it? Even though they say the message was in 1914, when Jesus, you know, changed from 1878, <laughs> he condemned false religion and in 1919 chose Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, I get it. But uh, here we are. It's still here. And there's questions. But in this book, verse by verse, they oddly start again with chapters 14 through 22 of the Bible book Jehovah wrote before considering the first 13 chapters of the books. That's the next book. We'll get to that. But again, the entire book is about them, Jehovah's Witnesses, versus religion, politics, and they even throw in big business there eventually. But note this from the Revelation Climax book, the last book of from 1988, they still point to these old books. They said this about 1963's Babylon the Great Has Fallen. Quote, Light continued to flash up for the righteous, so that in 1963, Jehovah's Witnesses published the 704-page book, Babylon the Great Has Fallen, God's Kingdom Rules. This gave in great detail the history of the rise and fall of Babylon the Great, the world empire of false religion, and it was climaxed with a discussion of the final nine chapters of Revelation. End quote. I remember this book. It was still an older book when I was a kid. But folks, 704 pages this baby was. <laughs> and again, reaching back a few minutes, according to Second Timothy read at the outset, None of this is apparently needed for the man because eh, the book Jehovah wrote that's found in the Bible on Revelation tells us we're completely equipped, that we've got everything we need. But let's roll out a 704-page book. And let me tell you, it's much more of the same, in stu same stuff in this book that we've discussed. It's all about them. There's subtle changes, like everything. The dates change, things change. But it's, again, all about them. And they've just kind of ramped up their bashing of all other religions, governments, and, as I, you will see, commercial interests of that time in the 60s. The May 1970 Kingdom Ministry, page 4, makes the following comment about this book on Revelation designed to bash all other religions. Quote, it is interesting that we received a number of letters from non-witnesses who got the Babylon book. That's what it was referred to, by the way. Back to the quote, the book pleased, the book pleased and impressed them. These persons read it rapidly, not lingering on details, and they learned major points, such as the identity of Babylon the Great and God's view of the churches. End quote. Let me pause there. When your life is on the line and you know the entire planet Earth is going to be destroyed in various ways, you never really want to, quote, linger on the details. Not even when it comes to the book of Revelation, apparently. Absolutely nothing in this book or the other four is supported by anyone or anything outside of Jehovah's Witnesses. And it ramped up the endless diatribe against religions and governments that was really the foundation for almost everything I grew up around and that I actually taught as an elder. 
meeting after meeting after public talk after service part spent telling the world that revelation was all about us while bashing every other institution on earth by applying beasts monsters whores natural disasters everything to the bad guys <laughs> And there's just nothing like Jesus and his faithful slave really subtly telling Jehovah's Witnesses to, well, not linger on the details. Don't do that. Just be impressed by our 704-page book. But again, don't linger on the details. Just take our word for it. <laughs> All of mankind is in the balance. <laughs> Listen, for those of us that have been part of Jehovah's Witnesses and grew up around this stuff, it's just, in hindsight, it's just unbelievable. It was all under our noses the whole time. Just the whole time. We're brainwashing you. Don't pay, don't pay attention to any of this. Don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. Don't linger on the details. <laughs> and there it was, buried in 704 pages, no word yet on if there'll be a future prophecy. Uh, regarding 704 page books, there's certainly got to be something in there, right? It goes from the time Charles Taze Russell uh, ate dinner to, yeah, I mean, this is what Jehovah's Witnesses have done for well over a century, their leadership. Okay, let's move on to 1969, book four, where we received then is finished the mystery of God, chapters 1 through 13, verse-by-verse verse discussion of the Bible book of Revelation. Again, Jehovah needed this. In the awake of 1971, July 22nd, page 32, under the titled article, Then is Finished the Mystery of God, we get this. Quote, do you, remember, we're not supposed to linger on the details, though. <laughs> Last book. Back to the quote, do you know the significance of, of this grotesque beast of Bible prophecy? How can its head be linked with outstanding political powers? What does the number 666 mean? You can find the answers to these questions in the Bible study aids, then is finished the mystery of God, and Babylon the Great has fallen, God's kingdom rules, books three and four, these fascinating books can help you to understand the highly symbolic Bible book of Revelation. Between the two of them, the entire book of Revelation is discussed verse by verse. You will find them to be valuable additions to your personal library. Request both books, totaling 1,088 pages, and send us only $1.25. Please send me the two books, Then is Finished the Mystery of God and Babylon the Great Has Fallen, God Kingdom Rules, for which I enclose $1.25. Hey, send also the gift booklets, World Government on the Shoulder of the Prince of Peace, and look, I am making all things new. End quote. 1969. I was two. You too, in 1969, can receive life or death information for just a buck 25. Make sure we get that, by the way. We need that. Cheaper than my pet rock, I might add. See last episode. <laughs> but there you have it. Books after book after book. And isn't it interesting they want to mention that it's 1,088 pages. What? Why, why does anyone care about this? Is it providing value for the buck 25 you're about to send me? And these are going to be valuable additions to your library. Uh, newsflash, out of print. They've burned the libraries to the ground. There's no more of this. But again, this was all new light. Back then, it was new light. And they were supposed to again, be telling this to everyone, everyone, these books for a buck 25. <laughs> By the way, throw in a couple of freebies. I mean, if they, look, this is the pre, there's probably a prophecy in here about Amazon, right? <laughs> I mean, they were doing it first. They were doing it first. In the interest of time, I've got to move on to my favorite book number five. 
Revelation, its grand climax at hand. This book probably impacts most of us the most. This is the governing body's latest effort to explain the book of Revelation as found in the Bible and written by Jehovah himself. And well, it was 35 years ago that we got this light on the book of Revelation. We can only conclude that Jehovah hasn't had much to say about the planet Earth since 1988, apparently. I, and again, I was newly married. I was, uh, what was I, 20, uh, 21, 22, this book rolled out. And I was digging into my memory. And during my time as a Jehovah's Witness, I believe I studied this book three times in the now long gone book study arrangement. An arrangement that was supposed to get us through the Great Tribulation together story for another show. Three times we looked into Revelation, its grand climax at hand, published in 1988. The Kingdom Ministry of October 1994, page 7, had this to say about the last of five books, quote, for many of us, a study of this publication will not only refresh our minds on points previously considered, but also sharpen our spiritual view of current developments leading up to Jehovah's Day of Triumph over all his enemies. The thousands who have joined our ranks during the past two to three years will certainly benefit from our indoctrination. I'm sorry, will certainly benefit from this third consideration of the Revelation Climax book in the Congregation Book Study, end quote. You'll note there that in this book, Revelation Climax, the governing body wanted to be sure they got the new people early after baptism and keep the propaganda rolling. Keep it going for those of us having to slog through this miserable book yet again for the third time. The first time I was in a group with an elder uh, book study conductor that didn't like to show up to meeting. He just, he was a good guy, but he didn't like to come. Uh, I think he struggled with this book as I found most elders did. And so as a 22-year-old ministerial servant, I ended up conducting this a lot. That's where I cut my teeth to become an elder. I conducted the Revelation Climax book. I was 22. I could barely tie my shoes, but I was now going to explain to you how vacuum cleaner... Wait, nope, that was old light. I was going to explain how whores and dragons, you know, are all about you and me. From that point on, I conducted it as an elder, and I will openly share from day one, I laughed at this book a lot. And I mean to tell you, I laughed a lot. And I did it openly. I, I'm not even ashamed of it now, obviously. I can't explain to you how I took the Live Forever book seriously. But this one? Nope. I literally laughed at it almost from the time I got it in my hands. And I look back now and I realize maybe my actual brain was peeking through the propaganda early on. I don't know. It's possible. But I got this book and I just couldn't believe it. It was absurd. And while conducting this book in my book study group three times, those in my group ended up laughing a lot with me. I can't explain it. I can't even go too deep into it. But I would be sitting there while they read the the reader was reading the paragraph, and I'd just be smiling and laughing like, you're kidding me. You're kidding me. And I'll get into some examples, but it's important to note that when you're reading the book of Revelation, Jehovah and Jesus can and will change their minds a lot. <laughs> when you're sharing your plan to destroy all of mankind from a holy book that you originally gave John, who gave it to us, you reserve the right to move things around just whenever you want to change things. And well, I guess just say oops a lot. I don't know. An example, the Kingdom Ministry of September 2006, pages three through six under adjustments for the book of Revelation, its grand climax at hand. Yeah, that's right, folks. This little thing in the Kingdom Ministry was an insert and it was as long as my leg. It featured adjustments to the Revelation Climax book. I'll spare you going into all of them, but go take a look. As a book study conductor, I had to have the Kingdom Ministry insert to fix what was said in the book we were studying and telling everyone their life depended on. 
And of course, this was book five from the original book found in the Bible. Are you following this? This insert from the kingdom in ministry was as long as my leg, and it spanned from adjustments that started in chapter four of Revelation Climax all the way to chapter 43 of Revelation Climax. Multiple dozens of changes that they couldn't go back and reprint the book. They just gave us an insert to say, oh, I'll pay no attention to that paragraph anymore. We've had adjustments. Again, as a Jehovah's Witness sits there and accepts that the heavens is changing their own book, the Bible. And then it's changing this book that they published to explain the first book, the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses sit there just staring out into outer space, accepting this. There were several things about the Revelation Climax book that stood out to me. I want to share a few. This book is blood red. And just like the three of the four before it, it features a blood red cover. Light by the judge, incidentally, was purple. Uh, he broke the chain like he often did with almost everything else, including beards. But come on, the judge was probably hammered. He gets a pass. But the rest of these books, four of the five are blood red. Uh, the illustrations in Revelation Climax book were unbelievable. I can tell you of an experience of a sister close to me, actually in my family, who complained to an elder that the illustrations in Revelation Climax were disturbing. This elder looked at her, and I'll never forget it, he looked at her and said, grow up. He told her to grow up. And if you've gotten this little treasure trove of a book, again, not in print or in a kingdom hall anymore, You'll see horrifying images of dragons, monsters, blood, whores, babies in danger. I often would sit there watching the kids and remembering my own experience with the Paradise Regained book, The Peach Colored Baby, and the My Book of Bible Stories as a kid, and how horrified I was by some of the illustrations. But the Revelation Climax book was next level. It had some of the most atrocious illustrations, horrifying monsters and blood and guts and fire and bulls and trumpets and whores and on and on it goes. And kids were exposed to it. They were sitting there looking at this book, looking at the pictures. Another big feature of this thing was the juvenile writing style. You would, some of the things that would make me laugh, you would read a Bible verse and then the question for reading the whole paragraph, which was just the Bible verse, was, hey, what did the paragraph say? <laughs> um, we just read it. It's a Bible verse. <laughs> I would bust out laughing, and everyone in my book study would bust out laughing with me. It was juvenile. It's still juvenile if you can get a copy. But another feature is the ins the, just the unbelievable intellectually insulting doctrines they try to pass off as fact in the Revelation Climax book, oftentimes contradicting something just two paragraphs earlier in the same book, in the same chapter. Because Jesus gets confused when discussing Revelation just like the rest of us. This book was unbelievable. Here's some examples of the insanity, and I'm not going to go deep on the teachings, but I'm just going to give you headlines because this is literally a treasure trove. As I already said, we got the book in 88. By the 90s, we were getting inserts saying, oh, that's all old light. Uh, dismiss that, read that paragraph that's old light, but then refer to this kingdom ministry insert, which is new light. I, and grown adults are sitting there. Here are some headlines, headlines, excuse me. From the book, Revelation is Climax at Hand, page 164 through 168, the, back to the back to the numbers. The 1,260 days of Revelation 11:3 is said to now be a literal period of time, but just six verses later in the Bible, the three and a half days are said to be figurative, and you guessed it, no basis for any of this, zero, just because, just because 1,260 is figurative. The judge wrote a watch article, went to jail. Six verses later in Revelation, Jehovah switches gears to John on Patmos. The three and a half years are suddenly figurative. No explanation. You don't need one. Just believe. 
from the book, pages 116, 117, 198, 199. This one is a personal favorite. It says this, Likewise, in the description of the 144,000 of Revelation 7, 4 and 14, 1, the number 144,000 is taken as literal. But this isn't a quote, by the way. I apologize. Again, 144,000 all comes from Revelation. Okay. We are told in this book to take it literally as they have taught for decades. But they seem to ignore a few things in the Bible book of Revelation, which is this that those 144,000 are, are literal. However, in the Bible, they're literally Jewish virgins. They're only men. And can you explain why they're standing on Mount Zion and why those features are figurative? <laughs> Numbers literal. All the parts about the people in that number are figurative. Ex explanation, not needed. Not needed. Not in the Revelation Climax book. And just in case anyone is doubting that every book, magazine, video, or anything Jehovah's Witnesses get today is coming from heaven, from Jesus himself, in case you doubt that, you this book, on, published in 1988, page 125, says this, quote, This suggests that resurrected ones of the 24 elders group may be involved in the communicating of divine truths today, end quote. Jehovah's Witnesses glob onto that stuff, folks. They glob onto it. So there you have it. Right from Revelation, it's Grand Climax, published in 1988, page 125. The Apostle Peter, Chuck Russell, Joseph Rutherford, Nathan Knorr, and Jesus all get into a room and they are the ones communicating things to Stephen Lett and his buddies in 2023. And they give it to the rest of us. In fact, in a strange brain twister, they wanted to be sure that we knew that they were communicating these truths by including this comment in the Revelation Climax book. Welcome to my brain. We're told this comes from Jesus. It's book number five. We're told that he wants us to know, hey, all of this stuff we give you today is coming from me and Chuck and the Apostle Peter and Nathan Knorr. And we're going to put it in this book that we're writing so that you know that. It's just unreal. And it can't be denied because it's in print. I wonder why it's no longer in Kingdom Hall libraries. But one more of my favorites from the Revelation Climax book, just because, as I mentioned, I would openly laugh while conducting this book. And I'm not, I, there was a time I was ashamed of that. I'm not now. I should have known this was a sign of things to come for me. I would often wonder how this book saw the light of day or was ever published. Here's a few for you. Just a few more. Chapter 22, page 146, The First Woe, Locusts. It says this, quote, This preaching involves more than the sparkling word. Also, they have tails and stings like scorpions. And in their tails is the authority to hurt the men five months, end quote, from Revelation 9.10, author Jehovah. <laughs> what could this mean, according to the Revelation Climax book? As they go about their kingdom work, Jehovah's Witnesses leave behind them publications, books, magazines, brochures, timely tracts. These contain authoritative statements based on God's word for the people to read in their homes. And they have a scorpion-like sting because they warn of Jehovah's approaching day of vengeance. Before the present generation of spiritual locust lives, excuse me, have to nail this. Before, little tidbit, take note, Revelation Climax, page 146, before the present generation of spiritual Locus lives out its lifespan, its divinely ordained work of declaring Jehovah's judgments will be completed to the hurt of all stiff-necked blasphemers. Lot to unpack, end quote. There we have it, the anointed who were giving us these scorpion-like stinging literature <laughs> would not die before the work was done. 1988, we sit here in 2023, 
Oops. They're all dead. <laughs> and John, just chilling on Patmos, was getting some signals that those trippy dreams he was having about locusts with scorpion tails were really those magazines left behind in laundromats by the same people who would we would later see on coffee breaks in a local Starbucks. Feel the sting. <laughs> Scorpion tails were watchtowers that we dumped in a laundromat to count a placement and our time. <laughs> oh, Revelation Climax, the gift that keeps giving. In chapter 21 of this book, we find one of my favorites, Under the Trumpet Blasts. Oh yes, the Trumpet Blasts. I'm going to save some time, but on Trumpet Blasts, those dreams John was getting about Trumpet Blasts in Revelation chapter 8, well... They were all about resolutions made at Jehovah's Witness conventions between 1922 and 1928. That's right. Instead of just showing John a snapshot of a football stadium with a few thousand people dressed up in attendance, he rolled it out in easy to understand ways for any human being to understand, much less the elderly John just sitting in exile on Patmos. Jesus himself, in pushing this book, veiled all of those life-altering messages in, uh, let's pick trumpet blasts. Let's do trumpets. From Questions to the Readers, The Watchtower of April 1st, 1990, page 31, it gets, gives us this. In Revelation chapters 8, 9, and 11, we read of seven angels who blew seven trumpets heralding plagues of great intensity on portions of mankind. These represent proclamations of Jehovah's judgments that have been publicized, excuse me, publicized by Jehovah's people throughout the time of the end, starting notably with the Cedar Point Convention of 1922. And then it tells us to see Revelation, its grand climax at hand, chapters 21 to 23 and chapter 26. That's right. As John penned those words in the Bible book of Revelation about trumpets, little did he know they all pointed to Cedar Point, Ohio. Who would have thought it? No one knew the United States even existed, the entire continent, or the publishing company that was the critical part of what Jesus was, you know, hiding here in what he called a trumpet blast. <laughs> but how about just one more for full appreciation of how blessed and under the direction of the Almighty, the guys in New York are. Revelation Climax chapter 21, applying Revelation 8, 6, the angels were preparing the planet Earth by doing this. Quote, oh my. In 1919, the magazine, The Golden Age, known today as Awake, had been brought forth as a journal of fact, hope, and conviction a trumpet-like instrument that would play a key role in exposing false religions' political involvements, end quote. In keeping with the theme, you're sitting in a book study, you're learning the trumpet blasts, and there's all kinds of illustrations in the book to look at, all point to Jehovah's Witnesses, a convention in unknown Cedar Point, Ohio. One of these now is pointing towards the Golden Age, published in 1919, a date we know well, and it's said to be exposing false religion. Would you like something from the Golden Age that it was publishing during this time period under the direction of Jesus Christ and his guys in New York? Here's my favorite one from the Golden Age, said to be a trumpet blast. Quote, If any overzealous doctor condemns your tonsils, Go and commit suicide with a case knife. It's cheaper and less painful. End quote. The Golden Age, April 7th, 1926, page 438. <laughs> That's right. Even in 88, when the Revelation Climax book is rolled out, they still point back to things like the Golden Age, which is telling people to kill themselves if they have tonsillitis. And not just kill themselves, don't jump off a bridge or take a pill, but no, use a case knife. Oddly detailed in what they want people to do to themselves. I give to you the April 7th, 1926 Golden Age, or as we're told in the Revelation Climax book, 
one of the amazing trumpet-like blasts that John was giving us in the book of Revelation. <laughs> oh, man. The absurdity is virtually unlimited. And as I said, I often laughed during this, the book study. I just laughed. Even then, I was indoctrinated. I was in it to win it, and I just laughed. And again, since this time, Jehovah hasn't had much to say about the book of Revelation. It's been 35 years since he apparently wants to explain the original book of Revelation that he wrote through the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so here we are, folks. Our last reference point is 1988's Revelation Grand Climax at hand, which in its pages points back to all four books before it and even the Golden Age saying, look at how great we are. <laughs> we have one of the Bible's most popular books given to us from God himself and countless attempts by all religions to interpret and understand it. But with the only true religion in the universe, They've taken five shots at this thing. And the last attempt was 1988. And well, they don't share or even study that book anymore. 35 years of new Jehovah's Witnesses, anyone baptized between 1988 and now, that haven't really, in many years, had the opportunity to study the last one three times like the rest of us did, They've mothballed it, taken it out of the Kingdom Hall library shelves, and completely forgotten it. And the only conclusion you can come to is, well, I guess those trumpet blasts have faded. <clears throat> Excuse me. But for many of us that were exposed to these teaching and visual aids, the nightmares we had about these have not. It was unbelievable. Five stops, five shots, five efforts to explain a book we're told we didn't need any explanation on. It was already perfect. And they made sure to pump us full of illustrations that were downright horrifying, especially for children. But listen, my favorite part of the entire book of Revelation is right at the end of the book in the Bible. After considering all of that inspired information from the governing body and the president's five books, uh, all of that information, the, the most important part of the entire book of Revelation is right at the end. And it's actually the end of the Bible. Are you ready to hear my favorite part? I'm not going to reference one of the five books from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. I'm just going to read from the Bible, the book we're told is perfect. And to me, it's all you need to know about Revelation. It says at Revelation 22, 18 and 19, the following, quote, I am bearing witness to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone makes an addition to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this scroll. And if anyone takes anything away from the words of the scroll of this prophecy, God will take his portion away from the trees of life and out of the holy city, things that are written about in this scroll. End quote. So wait a minute. Wait just a second here. The Bible, those five books, all that effort by Jesus to make sure we got that information through Jehovah's Witnesses, and well, I'm now confused as I reach the end of Revelation and the end of the Bible itself. I have a question. Did I read that right? Did the same Jesus who gave us the five books just say, and I quote, if anyone makes an addition to these things, God will give him the plagues that are written in this scroll. 
God will take his portion away from the trees of life and out of the holy city, end quote. Did he just say that? That anyone who makes an addition to the perfect book, the Bible, is going to get all the nasty stuff and those pictures and blood and guts and horrors and monsters and getting eaten and fire and bowls and trouble. They're, they're the ones who are going to get all this? I mean, wait. We got five books added to this scroll. And you're here indicating that no one is to add to this book in any way, shape, or form, or they will be destroyed. But then you had your guys in New York write five books filled with comedy, lies, insanity, and more. I mean, wait a minute. What? The word revelation comes from the Greek, and it, mean, it comes from the Greek word apocalypse, which means basically an unveiling, an uncovering, a revealing. It's undeniable. Telling the world that God's book, the Bible, needs you to explain is certainly a revelation. A revelation that you indeed are an arrogant, man-made cult. I want to thank everyone for listening in this week as we tackled very high level the book of Revelation. Wherever you may be, be well.